Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. And Matt today definitely has overcome some big challenges. We have Matt Galland, who's one of the legends of copywriting and direct response marketing. Matt is known as the mad marketing scientist because he's constantly testing new and radical ideas inside his companies, which we will talk about. Matt made his first sale online on the internet in 1996. Since then, he's built over 39 profitable websites and his companies have sold over $10 million worth of products and services online. Matt, thank you so much for joining me. It's great to be here. I love talking about uh, copywriting and marketing, so I'm excited. And, you know, Andre Chaperon, who I talked to, said you need to talk to Matt. The guy just studies copywriting and marketing, knows copywriting and marketing. So I'm excited to hear your big lessons learned, some of the mistakes along the way, too. And I always like to include a fun fact. What's a fun fact about you that most people don't know? Most people probably don't know that uh, not only do I play guitar, but I was... You know, part of a, of a hard rock band, and we recorded a, an album called Myth Conception. It was, you know, I'm still still proud of that record. I still listen to it once in a while. Uh, if again, it's it's a good hard rock album. So, what was your role in the band? I was uh, kind of the main songwriter and uh, guitar player. So, yeah. So you're putting your copywriting skills, you know, your writing skills, even back then. Yeah, there's a lot of. Uh, overlaps with the creative process I think with uh, any sort of, of song and, and writing or writing a sales letter. So will I be able to find one of these videos on YouTube or no? No, this was like pre YouTube, oh. you know, okay. this was because I will find it and I want to put it at the end of this interview, but there's nothing well, like no, that. I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a sample track and uh, you, okay. can, you, you can pop that at the end. All right, cool. Yeah. Um, so first off, Matt, What's one thing, before we get into, I want to get into your story, um, what's one thing the audience can do right now to get a quick win, to get results that's worked for you with copywriting and direct response? Quick win. So we're going to talk about, you know, from a copy standpoint, yeah. because I think one of the big wins that people can do, and, and again, I test things all the time, uh, we're finding a lot of big wins with, with better design, and, and that, that's been a trend for the last three, four years, mm -hmm. uh, when I started, I was told very implicitly, design doesn't matter, you know, by guys like Dan Kennedy, even John Carlton, who was one of my main mentors, and I, and I bought into that, which I think at the time was probably true, but, you know, as we know, the market evolves all the time, and I think now it's evolved to the point where they want pretty, they, they want a good feeling on the site, so this design's a big deal, so... You know, you want to have design that enhances and supports the copy. Uh, that you know, you can almost whatever story you wrote, you can just follow the graphics and follow the design, and get the story. Um, I'm a big fan of, of Mind Valley's designs. They've, yeah. they've, they've done a good job, and I think they helped elevate the the market quite a bit. So there's one thing I think copywriters should pay more mm -hmm. attention to if they're not already doing so, is is start learning and, and having a knife for design. So what have you done that's worked as far as design goes for your sites and products? You know, one of the big things is the pictures. So, so we've tested thousands of pictures. So as you know, as, as you said, I'm the mad market scientist right. and, and we've, we've literally tested thousands of pictures. So what we, you know, the big lesson, if you will, is that you want real pictures. You know, you should really stay away from stock graphics as much as you can. Uh, stock graphics often drop response. Hmm. You know, people people can just tell if something is real or fake. So stock, you mean like stock of a real person? Not you're not talking like a cartoon type of stock. But if you're going to pick a real person as opposed to a stock real person, when I say stock, I mean you know, there's I stock photo, big stock photo. Right. Those are sites where you can buy pictures or the rights to use the pictures right. that have made that have been made by professional photographers. And we've all seen the cheesy office shot with, you know, all the races and they're all smiling and it just it just reeks of, of fakeness. Uh, so that's more what I'm referring to. Okay. As far as, as stock. Yeah. P 
people want authenticity. I, I, one of the things I'm I'll talk about today, and again, we've I've got enough data to tell you this uh, without any any doubts that authenticity is one of the big keys right. in copy and in and in design and in pictures and in everything. So, yeah. um, again, you want to have pictures that just are real. So they, they're not pro. They don't have that super polished look and feel. It's it's real. Real. Yeah, I asked that because I know one of your sites, which we'll talk about, you have some really good images. They're not of real people that are of cartoons. So that's why I asked because you have mm. the um, the old copywriter picture. You know what I'm talking about? And you yeah. have the, the guy who, scam, you know, who scammed you. And so that that's a design element. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, when I, I used to go to Japan a lot, and in Japan, I, I noticed that almost all the products had cartoons. And I just had a naha one day. This this is like you know, six years ago, before before the doodle, before cartoons yeah. came became uh, well used. And I just had an uh, aha where it's you know people can see a cartoon or, or a comic graphic, and they don't have any judgments. Like nobody looks at Mickey Mouse and says, "Wow, his ears are too big." <laughs> right. Right. Nobody looks at at Goofy and says his nose is too long. Uh, so you can very you know, true. I never noticed that, but yeah. But when, when we look at human beings, we're, you know, usually most people are very judgmental. Interesting. So for that reason, I, I think cartoons and uh, car comics and doodles had its run. I, you know, we've tested doodles and we're seeing horrible results with it now. Um, but I, I think that that style of, of design is very powerful. Yeah. So what's one of your crazy tests that you could share? <laughs> crazy tests. Wow. Um, you know, I, I really like to test everything. I mean, right now, you know, some people might consider this crazy, but we're testing uh, email delivery systems. So uh, I won't say who we're testing, but uh, we're testing two different companies. I'm sure so people we're can make splitting a guess. the list. Yeah. One company we heard has a 30% higher delivery. So wow. we're putting that to the test, which so far it's not, which is why we test because, um, you know, there's so many things that are being told and I'm not saying they're lies but they're they're not necessarily applicable to me or to you and uh, sometimes they are lies so we're testing that right now and uh, it's interesting yeah so what's the one that someone dubbed you as a man marketing scientist you know that that happened you know I was talking to under chaperone Mark Hardy um, you know this various internet marketers and uh, one of the things that just surprises me is that most people are not obsessed with testing like I am. So I think uh, when just people saw how, how, how much I like to test and how much mm -hmm. I test, that's, that's where it kind of is. So where did, what did they see you testing at the time when they called you that? Well, you know, I have a lot of sites. So I think it's just the volume of tests. Like right now in all my companies, I am probably have – about 25 different tests on, on different sites and on each test we're testing three four things so at any one time I'm probably testing a hundred things not counting what's being tested on AdWords and mm -hmm. you know on other levels mm -hmm. just just on the sites so what's so I a, think it's just a crazy thing volume what's a test that surprised you uh, probably the test that surprised me the most actually happened about six months ago and uh, this this is this is a good copy one so we added an article after the opt-in. So usually, you know, my, my standard funnel in my companies is opt-in and then they go to a sales letter and of course the follow-up sequence is where you get a, a big chunk of the sales. Right. So we added one piece between the sales letter and the opt-in, which is, which is the article. And it increased conversions by 400 percent whoa and we've actually been able to by split testing the article increase the conversions even more so that's that blew my mind i mean i'm i'm, I'm still that's I'm wild still fascinated so yeah you know and and the article is you know three steps for whatever and, and it, it's it's good content and prepares them for the sales letter yeah so yeah, I think uh, we're seeing that trend right now. That you know, art, they're called article landing pages. Uh, it's very hot with affiliates as well, and and it's powerful because if an affiliate 
feels comfortable sending their their readers to that article lander and feels that it's giving them value. It's a lot easier for them to mail versus sending them straight to a sales lander. Right. Yeah. So it it has a few positive effects, which is I think a better uh, response from the readers and and higher conversions if it's well done. So what made you decide to do that? Because that almost seems counterintuitive to what everyone else is doing. Well, yeah, it, it is very counterintuitive because from from most of my tests, any time I've added a step, it lowers conversion. Right. Um, so yeah, it was it was definitely counterintuitive. But no, I'm just seeing that trend in the fitness space, mm-hmm. and um, I'm good friends with the, one of the guys kind of leading that trend. So talked with him. He told me his results. I'm like, well, let's try it out. And we- <laughs> Um, so I want to hear go early on, Matt, um, and you know, from growing up, what was something that influenced, inspired you early on? How early on? Yo, know, growing up. Growing up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I read I read some books, I guess, as a teenager that uh, really made me understand the value of business. And uh, there was always a certain entrepreneurial drive, even you know, 15, 16. So it was really at that point that um, I knew I wanted to be a businessman. What did you do? Uh, well, <laughs> at that time I was delivering newspapers. Actually, you know, my first real uh, business was started when I was about 19. Uh, I was a franchisee for College Pro Painters. Oh. I was also starting to train people as a personal trainer already at 19 when I started university. Um, I had my degree in, in kinesiology and science of physical activity. So, you know, all throughout university I trained people and uh, I was a franchisee for College for Painters for two years, which was, even to this day, the most hardcore business training I've ever done. You know, we were knocking on doors in February, it was minus 30, minus 40, and asking people at, at 8 o'clock at night if they would like a free estimate to paint their house. Wow. Um, and uh, it, was, it was very challenging. And, you know, my first 10 estimates, I had no sales, which, is, which was bad. And uh, I just remember feeling like, man, am I going to get this? And, f- and then finally started turning around. And I, I, I won the most improved manager of the year that year and the year after. So, wow. um, What was, turned it around was, for you? Yeah, just just learning the sales process. I mean, it's it's all about sales. I, you know, I, I didn't do any of the painting. I was just get making estimates and, and selling the jobs. So uh, you know, by the end, my, my closing rate was fifty percent wow. on the second year, which is which is pretty good. So, do you get that yearning for business from your parents? No, um, it, it might be the opposite. You know, I, I I was a big rebel as a young man. So you know, my my parents are. Uh, you know, they, they're they both retired now, but they, they did their 30, 35 years for a company and they retired. So I, th- I think somewhere along the rebellion, you know, I'm like, well, I don't want to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to be my own, uh, my own boss, so to speak. So mm-hmm. it's probably the, like I said, the opposite. When, when I started college for, college for painters, my dad was sure that he was going to lose the house, <laughs> even though he wasn't involved. <laughs> so what did, then what did you do after that? After college pro painters, what was the next business? You know the big, the next big entrepreneurial um, adventure was um, organizing self defense and uh, in, in mixed martial art events. Oh, really? Yeah. So I, I became passionate about that when I was nineteen, and uh, there was this this man named Christoph Clarkston who I uh, wanted to learn from. So I contacted him. I bought his DVDs, which John Carlton wrote the letter, by the way. Okay. Great sales letters, the one with the nickel and the skinheads. One, one, still one of my favorite sales letters to this day. He attached, he attached a nickel on top of the letter, a real nickel, and then the copy went something like, you know, in the, in this bar, your your life wasn't worth a nickel. It was, uh, and it was a great story. So I, I bought the product, started training this stuff, loved it. Contacted him and said, you know, how can I uh, train with you? Well, he's like, you know, you can fly to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Again, I'm a, I'm a university student, so I didn't have a lot of money to do that with. So I decided, well, instead of going there, which would have costed me, you know, like three thousand dollars with the flights and stuff, I'm like, you know, why don't I bring him here, organize an event, and if I break even, I'm happy. So I think we did. I, I you know, 
maybe three dozen seminars over wow. five, six That's years a lot. span. Yeah, yeah. So he'd, he'd come down frequently and uh, we'd organize the events and did anti-rape seminars and, wow. and uh, all, all kinds of stuff that, that was fun. That was pretty so that was a great innovative adventure. of you to, to do that. <laughs> it, was, it was a good solution at the time. And from there, uh, again, the personal training kept, kept building up. And then I moved to Vancouver uh, when I was 24. And you know, that's where I really used my, my marketing skills. So that was the most, it was a new world because the trainer market was competitive. You know, I went from a, a little town of 100,000 people where I was like probably the only trainer making a living. <laughs> And moved to uh, Vancouver, which is, was a big city and, and a lot of trainers. And using my marketing skills, within about six months, I was the busiest or the second busiest guy at, at World's Gym. Wow. And World's Gym was, you know, you're all independent. You just do your own marketing. Right. So I was, I was placing ads in a newspaper, driving them to the site, and then they would get a free consultation, and then I'd close them. That funnel was so good that, you know, I was closing 95% wow. of the people that would come for a free consultation. Um, so that was my next big marketing experience. So what did and you I write was, in the ad? It was pretty simple. You know, it was a classic ad. It was, you know, the, learn the, the seven critical factors you need to know before you even think of hiring a, tr a personal trainer. That was the headline. So from, from again, from just a little classified ad to the web page, uh, which was that full blown report, and then you know call me for a consultation. Huh. Pretty simple funnel, but uh, I think my return on those ads was like twenty times or twenty five x. It was it was pretty ridiculous. Wow. Yeah. Most people are probably doing nothing though. Most trainers, you mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Most. I mean, you trainers had a formal setup. You had a formal sales funnel. <laughs> I did. Yeah. Well, again, I was studying copy. I was studying marketing. So, uh, yeah. It, it was it was ahead of its time in that market. So then, what was next? Next was, you know, I got into internet marketing for real. So again, throughout this time, you know, I was studying marketing even from you know five, six, seven years ago, mm -hmm. before before this. And you know, my my background is really copywriting, which I think is the ultimate background for any marketer. So from there, I. I had a client who was a skincare uh, expert. She has one of the biggest private manufacturing skincare companies in the world, wow. or in, in the States at least. So she says, you know, she saw what I could do and, and you know, my marketing skills, and she's like, yeah, I'd like to create a product for you. We'll partner up and stuff. So that was my first uh, real product that was successful online called uh, it was an anti aging serum. And you know, I, I slaved my ass off on that letter. You know, John Carlton ripped it apart maybe five or six times. And finally, you know, he said, wow, this is really good. And when he said that, I, I knew, okay, you know, John doesn't dish out compliments too easily. So we launched it and it was, it was very successful. Like, you know, it, it was profitable right out of the gate, which is the best feeling in the world when it comes to launching something. And, uh, from that was that was that was really the launching pad. I, I couldn't sleep for a couple of days. What did he rip apart that you changed? Uh, probably probably everything. <laughs> you know, John John didn't mince words. You know, this was early in John's career as a copywriting coach, and back then you'd have unlimited access for a year for like a ridiculously low amount of money. So I really took advantage of that. Uh, yeah, now now it's a different deal. So, what were some things you changed that made a difference? Oh man, you know that's that's a that's a long time ago. But um, you know, really worked hard on the headline. You know, the headline is is you know really nailed it. I would say at the time, and um, yeah, just cleaning it up. You know, I, I think copywriting to me is is great. Copywriting is sixty seventy percent edit, editing. So you got to edit a sales letter to death uh, to to make it great. You know, you can write a good letter and launch it, and maybe it'll work. But uh, if if you're in a really tough market, you got to just edit, 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 and uh, that's what that's what I did there. So. So what was the headline? Um, doctors are shocked by a 60 second facelift in a bottle that turns back the clock ten in ten years in only 60 days. 
I pulled out my wallet halfway through that. That's, that's <laughs> right. I like that. Yeah. Um, and so what were some of the most successful campaigns, Matt, that you had and, and why they were effective? Um, you know, the next, the next big venture was in the bodybuilding world. Um, so nat- specifically natural bodybuilding. So my friend who uh, very good friends with, partners with uh, Wade Lightheart, not three-time national natural bodybuilding champion. So that means no drugs, tested, whole nine yards. Right. So he, um, he won his title and I said, hey, you know, let's package your information. And we did and uh, that, that was a great run. That was my next big success. And uh, that business is still going. It's, it's evolved quite a bit. But, you know, our first offering, which was uh, Freaky Big Naturally, <laughs> that yeah. was a new product. Uh, that that was that was very successful at its time for its time, and again, you know, the, the market has evolved quite a bit. So, would that even work today? Probably not. Which is something that that's worth that's worth noting. Uh, my next big go back to that was, one actually. So, how did you get the word out? How did you sell? Was it online, offline, both? Yeah, it was online. Yeah, uh, AdWords. I'm 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 pretty skilled with AdWords. I've been doing AdWords. I think literally since AdWords started. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I've kept up with, with all the changes. So we, we were buying traffic through AdWords. I've always preferred buying traffic than, than any other methods. So. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so you were saying the next one? Next one was uh, in the guitar market. So uh, we, we've, we've had tremendous success in the instructional music product world. And uh, now that's expanded. I mean, we, we do literally just about every instrument from, uh, from violin and vibraphone to... Vibraphone? Guitar and bass, yeah. Wow. Yeah, vibraphone was a bomb. There's, there's not a lot of players that, that, <laughs> that do that, but yeah, vi- violin's doing well, and uh, guitar, bass, piano, saxophone, harmonic, all that stuff. So what so, worked? Yeah, a lot yeah. of success there. What worked with the guitar product? <clears throat> you know, the, the the holy grail as a marketer, the holy grail as as, as a businessman is is to have a, a front end offer that's profitable. And you know, there's a lot of people out there that and maybe you're listening to this and you have one of those. Let me tell you that you know, once you have those, you have to run. You you got to go crazy, and uh, maximize you know as much traffic as you can, as fast as you can, because a million things can change that maybe it won't work in a week or a month or a year from now. Right. So you know, what we had is is a front end winner that was. Uh, literally a winner for eight years wow. in a very tough market. I mean, you know, guitar. I, I can't tell you how many guys I've seen try to do an instructional guitar product, and you know, in in two weeks, Tons their campaign is is stopped because they can't make it work. Yeah. So that was the main thing, and you know, if we want to get more into business dynamics, having a deep, deep back end um, and ways to to really maximize. The customer value are, are the keys. It's very hard to make one product work. Again, that's why I say it's the holy grail. If you got one product and you're selling it and you're making money, uh, man, you, you're what you've got there is a ticket to make ten times more money than you are now if you add all the other components. So, what else did you have to add to make it even more successful? Membership component, membership site, um, and again, very deep back. And we have sixty products now. So wow. that, that was organically built. I yeah. mean, you know, we didn't start with sixty, but you know, every every year we're creating uh, six to twelve new products in in those markets. So that's that's really uh, <laughs> you know the, the sky's the limit as far as selling more stuff when you have that many products. What's your process for creating more products or creating a product? Good question. So process. You know the, the number one thing, and, and you know again, I'm I've probably given you a different answer three years ago, but I'm, I'm going to give you the answer that that I think is relevant for now. Yeah. Um, you got to have great talent. You know the days, the days of B grade guys. Okay, this is this is going to be a harsh statement, but the days of B grade guys, um, being able to make. A living are, are coming to an end. I'm not saying that some guys can't make it. They might have other ways that they can connect with people. But 
I think we're about to enter a new era of, of internet marketing or marketing, and that's just the evolution of things, where people want to learn from the best people. They want to learn from superstars. They want to learn from people that they have a deep connection with. So those are three different things. You know, if you look at, for an example, uh, you know, a true expert, you know, a genius in their field, that's, that's one thing. A celebrity, somebody like, Jillian Michaels, who's on TV, that's that's another thing. You know, you look at Elliot Hulse, who has a million subscribers on YouTube. You know, people love this guy, so it's very easy to sell things to these people. Mm -hmm. So those are three different categories of of experts and talents that that's who I would want to choose from uh, before I create a product. Again, you know, and we've seen that in the guitar market. Where our best-selling guys are either guys that are, you know, quasi-famous or that are really good at building rapport, and people like them as as personalities. Mm -hmm. Those are the two things that I look for, um, yeah. because, you know, I think the days of just being able to hype something. There's and, so much research out there that people can figure yeah, anything the, out on the internet. The days of hype are, are all but over. So. You know, it's really about, again, substance and authenticity. Yeah. You've got to have somebody that's got the goods. And then we don't have to work as hard as copywriters. We just have to really highlight them. And you still need good marketing and good hooks. So that's you know, the first piece. The second piece is you really have to nail you know, what is the product going to do for them. And, and you know, one of the things we learned from, for example, in the guitar market, where we covered every single niche from blues, jazz, rock, acoustic, I mean, every, every style. Uh, and you, know, you have to nail, there's only two or three styles where you can make money, okay? So, <laughs> so you know, to do a, a bluegrass product, you're not, you're not gonna make money doing that. Um, and, and, We've seen the same thing in, in the fitness world. You have to really offer something that the masses or, the, or a, a, a target niche really is excited about. So those are two components, having the right guy and having the right angle, which you're going to write your hook off of anyways. So hook angle of the product. For me, marketing starts on the product level. You know, people, you know, I think there's too much disconnect sometimes between product creation and marketing. You know, I'm a businessman, I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm more involved at controlling the whole process. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why I've been successful. And, and you look at guys like Evan Pagan, again, he was, you know, they're doing the whole nine yards. And of course, there's examples, you know, all the big publishers, Rodale, Phillips, uh, Boardroom, you know, they hire copywriters. So you can still make that work. But, you know, again, good a good process starts on the product creation level, you know, Gary Bensavinga says a, a mighty product tr trumps uh, a mighty pen. So mm, it's a good one. Um, yeah. So what was working? You said that front end offer. What was working with that front end offer that was actually profitable? I, I, I then it goes back to what I just said. We nailed we nailed the uh, the promise. You know, we nailed the promise. So that, that was the key, you know, the, uh, the promise that we made. And, and again, I don't want to give it away because we, we're still out there with that offer. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't edit it. So don't share anything that uh, you can't share. <laughs> yeah, so, so we, we just nailed the, the, the hook. We nailed the, what people were going to get from buying this product and going through that. Yeah. So, um, and, and part of that is the phraseology as well, that, which is where we come in. You know that that's where the copywriter comes in. So. so, man, what's another successful campaign, and why? What was the component that was so effective for it? Well, I have some recent campaigns. Again, I'm I'm also in the in the fitness market. Yeah, and uh, I am I am working with uh, <laughs> with Elliot Hulse. So who's who's a, a phenom on YouTube? Yeah, I reached out to him actually um, like two weeks ago. Oh, to cool. have him on. And um, I don't know, it must be a relative who handles the, they have the same last name. So they said he's very busy, probably because of you, creating products. <laughs> so to, to get in touch later on for, uh, for an interview. So yeah, no, he's, uh, he's great. So 
you know, with him, it's it's been a, a great experience because there's so much love for the guy that uh, it makes it makes our jobs as marketers, you know, ten times easier. So, you know, tremendous success with those campaigns, and you know, again, what's the key factor there? You know, he is. You know, his his rapport, his um, I guess the the love that he's getting from his viewers is. Uh, Make, makes our job a million times easier. Yeah, but, you know, there's going to be people seeing whatever you produce who have never seen him on YouTube, you know, sure. who are still going to sure. purchase. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I mean, we've multiplied conversions, right. uh, you know, five, six hundred percent from when from what he had before. Right. Yeah. So, you know, market, <laughs> you know, which has come from better design. Um, you know, here's something interesting. A lot of times, and, and we've all heard the debate, long copy versus short copy. Right. One of the things I like to do when I test, especially when it, like, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, pour my heart out, write a 16-page letter, a 12-page letter, or 8-page letter, and, and you know, I'll take entire sections, you know, like a page, like, you know, a, kind of a, you know, a theme or a topic in a letter. I'll rip it out and test with or without it. I would say most of the time, ripping out components boosts conversions. Again, boosts you have, it. yeah, boost. So, you know, there's still this still ends up being a three, four right. page, five, six, seven page letter. Mm. But um, ripping out components sometimes is is very powerful, and we we've done that a few times, and I think every single time it's been a pair raise. You know, John Carlton taught me that, you know, write write a sales letter. Take your first two or three pages, throw them on the trash. In the trash, page three or four is where your sales letter starts. Hmm. And uh, we did that recently. We we took literally it was probably two three pages of copy, just ripped it out, started on page three, and uh, I think it doubled or tripled conversion. Wow. So a lot of times uh, you got to just hook people right away. You know, it's important as too as copywriters. One of the big things I'm really really conscious of as I'm writing letters now is uh, you know where are people coming from you know where are they at in the buying cycle uh, right now I'm running a sales order for a supplement and the the first version we're doing is going to be a joint venture with another party so I'm factoring in yeah that's a big deal it's a huge deal and it completely you know I'll get into another side note on, on affiliate traffic versus yeah. cold traffic but it's completely changing the letter because I know yeah, I know what they're going to see before they come here. I know that they have rapport, so they don't need as much copy. And, you know, we were actually, <laughs> a business partner of mine has a lot more experience with affiliate traffic, and I have more experience with cold traffic. So interestingly enough, he had some ideas that were the complete, very different than mine. So we split tested, we separated the affiliate traffic, split tested our two ideas, and then did the same thing on the cold traffic. My idea was a crushing winner with the cold traffic, and his was a crushing winner with the affiliate. So we, we had the exact inverse response with the same test, inverse response with affiliate and cold traffic. So that was a big aha for me. And uh, so now, again, I'm very conscious of where it's coming from, and, and uh, it changes the copy quite a bit. So how did it change the copy in that case with the cold versus the affiliate? I give it affiliate. You need less copy. You need probably uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 percent less copy than you need with cold traffic. Uh, you need, I think, less hype. You need less of a big hook. So all these things that work with cold traffic, because with cold, you got to go from zero to buying in 20 minutes, right? They, they don't know you. They don't know who you are. So it's very challenging. You really have to, uh, you know, hook them in. I mean, Ada is very. That hasn't changed. Attention, interest, desire, action. You got to go through that process very quickly. Um, but I think when people go from from affiliates, they're already at interest. Right. You know, they're already at the I in the formula. So you just got to kind of take them from I to D. Uh, versus with cold, you got to go attention, grab their attention, and then build the interest and move on. So how do you know when to stop ripping out copy? You know, <laughs> like you can just keep going until you're left with like a paragraph. Um, you know, the answer is you never stop. 
you know, I, I think when you stop. I guess when you're testing mad scientists, you just keep ripping out coffee till it doesn't perform. Well, yeah, I mean, as long as you can buy traffic and as long as a sales letter is getting traffic, you should be optimizing. You know, what I've found is that uh, sales letters that I didn't optimize, they all died. So the sales letters that I've tested and tested and keep testing, they stay alive. So, you know, that, that, that was a big lesson for me as well. So yeah. I, I, I keep testing. Yeah. And sometimes a sales letter will get to the point where we, no matter what test we throw at it, uh, it, it doesn't, it's not profitable anymore as a front end. Mm -hmm. So then it, it becomes a, a back end product mm -hmm. and uh, you move on. You try to create another winner. Yeah. So obviously, Matt, you've had a lot of winners. What's been one that didn't work and, and why? <laughs> Uh, let me think. <laughs> you know, there was a, this was a long time ago, but, you know, I, I, I uh, this is more of a, this was an AdWords failure, but <laughs> there was a photographer in Phoenix who, who wanted me to build a site for him and do the marketing. So, I sent him a bunch of traffic and and it all failed. You know, it was uh, I wasn't I wasn't laser beam. You know, so one of the things with AdWords is to really be a uh, laser beam, especially for a local. I was used to doing national, international campaigns, which is what I did for his business, which didn't make any sense. So so that that was a failure. But again, it wasn't necessarily a marketing. It was in a copywriting failure. It was just more of a of an AdWords failure. I wasn't sending him the right traffic. So that, that Any comes. other good ones that um, you learned from, lessons learned from campaigns that didn't do – maybe I mean, it wasn't a failure, but it didn't do as well as you thought, and then you yeah. changed something. Yeah, you know, here, here's one that's, that really surprised me. I, I was sure we were going to nail it. So um, we came up with an offer to give people a free guitar, a free Whoa, electric guitar. that's great. Guitar. Yeah, and it bombed. You know, it was, it was worse – Trying to give away a guitar was worse than, you know, not t taking the guitar away uh, was a much better result than trying to give a guitar away. Huh. So that was kind of a shocking uh, experiment. I, we were very confident that that was going to work. So, you know, they'd get the information package and they'd get the guitar, but it just so happens nobody wanted a, a free guitar that they didn't uh, care about. You know, I guess in the guitar world, the brand or whatever, so to speak, has, has a lot to do with it. So, hmm, That's an interesting yeah. one. Yeah, that was interesting. Um, um, go ahead. <laughs> I know you have a bunch of good shocking ones. Well, you know, we, every, every product we do, for example, in the instructional music space, um, we try to make them a front-end winner. So maybe only about 20 25% make it. The other 75 don't. So, yeah, I've, I've had, I mean, we can call those failures. So, so right there, I've, I've had a lot of failures. A lot of times, again, it, it goes back to not nailing the hook or the product isn't appealing enough to enough people. So all those things come into play or, or, the, or the teacher isn't appealing enough. So lots of failures, if you will, in that department. And the same thing in the fitness space. Again, we've tried a lot of things. Um, and some products don't work as front ends, but the key, the thing to keep in mind is, is if you have one product that's working and you're, you're creating other products in that market or in that niche, you can just back and then put them in the eater, autoresponder sequences, upsell them with one click upsells and so on and so forth. So a lot of times those failures still end up making money, still become profitable products because we'll we'll find other places for them, but they're they're not the big winners that we're all we're all aiming for. Yeah. So what's another what's a front end in the fitness that you thought was gonna work and you had to put it somewhere else in the funnel? Because it wasn't working. Yeah, you know, there's there's another uh health expert. I mean again he's 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 a very well respected guy and uh amazing product. I mean personally I think it's one of the best fitness products out there. And um we couldn't make it work, you know. So, yeah, that was another experience. Again, I can't name his name, but uh, that that was another surprising experience. Why do you think? Why do you think it wasn't working? 
you know, I, I think people, I mean, the fitness space online is so competitive now. Right. It's hyper competitive. It's like, it, it's kind of like where weight loss was a few years back. I mean, it's just, you know, because there's so many people that are trainers that, that have expertise and they all see, you know, it's all the dream, it's everybody's dream to just be able to make a living on, on, on the internet. Right. So I think that's part of it. I think maybe his personality was a little bit lacking. Uh, you know, he's a very smart man. He's a genius, I would say, but maybe a little too cerebral for most people. Yeah. Um, what we found is, again, warmer personalities, people that connect with people are, is what works. So I think that's what was missing there. So do you end up coaching some of these people a little bit on these elements because you have to bring it out in the copy? Like what Absolutely. do you find that helps people connect? <laughs> you know, uh, they, I think the most interesting thing, the most interesting thing is an evolved human being. You know, I think, uh, you know, somebody who has a lot of self-development, somebody who's grown a lot, somebody who's, got perspective. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you look at Elliot Hulse, um, you know, extreme self-development, so always working on himself, always evolving and growing. And so people are, are I think, are fascinated by wh where he's evolved to. And I think that's very attractive to people. Right. Um, you know, and I've seen similar things in the guitar market where our, our best-selling guy um, has that, you know, he's, he's toured Europe. He's played on stage with, with a lot of legends. Um, you know, he's just got that, that seasoned, interesting, charismatic personality. So uh, that's hard to coach. I mean, I can coach people to, to, to be better on camera, but that, you know, I can't help them become a better human being in, <laughs> in 24 hours. Right. So <laughs> you can't, that's, that's Horrible. Well, you can, but yeah, uh, you can only make so much progress. Yeah. So what do you tell people, Matt? You, I mean, obviously have a lot of clients. What do you tell people that often they don't listen? Or what are some of the big mistakes they're making? <laughs> yeah, sometimes people, uh, you know, want to do things their own way. Sometimes people, you know, have had challenges sometimes with, with people that don't understand marketing and you know, they, they, they wish that they could have a sales letter with just their picture or a picture of the product and that would work. Uh, so dealing with people's egos around copy, around being framed a certain way mm -hmm. can be challenging, um, which I tend not to work with people like that, but I have, you know. So that's, that's always uh, – because it makes our lives as copywriters far harder. You know, it's already hard to write copy that's going to be a winner. If I have to go back and edit that copy to please uh, the talent that's being sold, it's it's a lot harder. But you you have to do that to a certain extent. And and again, I I think authenticity works. So you know, I try to highlight their personalities in some respects. Right. Uh, like one guy, you know, one of the sales, one of the lines of copy is, you know, you could sell a dinosaur. I don't even own a cell phone. Which is true. The guy doesn't even own a cell phone. So I'm highlighting their, their, their quirks of their personality um, as much as I can. But you, sometimes you, you still need strong copy. But you have to be careful in today's, you know, in today's world. You, you know, the FTC is, is, is out there. I mean, if you want something on Google or Facebook, especially Google, I mean, they are stricter than the FTC. I mean, if you can get a site approved by Google – you are doing well. So the holy grail these days, in my opinion, is a front-end winner that's approved on Google. You, you know you've got uh, you've made it because you've you've passed through the the scrutinizing hype filters, and you're able to still get the response. Yeah. So Matt, what's some of your favorite headlines? I know you mentioned the one with the nickel, and uh, and then your other one. What's what's another couple of your favorites? That I wrote or just in general? Yeah, you wrote or in general. Uh, you know, I mean, John Carlton's one-legged golfer is, is, you know, automatically jumps to mind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from Ben Savenga, I liked um, 
I think it was Get Rich Slowly, I think was one of his headlines. And I, and I loved it because it was just one of these big ahas. And, and Gary was really, you know, where I started. I was, I was at his retirement event. And that was really one of the turning points for, you know, downgrading the hype. Because I learned from Gary and Gary Hubbard and John Carlton and, uh, you know, they were hype masters. <laughs> you know, you wrote balls to the wall, strong, over-the-top copy. Um, that's, that's how I would label it now. But at the time, I didn't know any better That's who that that was normal copy. So when I saw Gary's stuff, I'm like, wow, this this is a lot different. And he, he talked about testing headlines, you know. Adding the word may, uh, you know, in his word, it, it may work. And that was increased response. So that was a big aha for me, just that whole softening the, the strength of the claims. You know, finding that sweet spot in the middle. You know, obviously it needs to be strong enough to attract people and get them excited. But if it's too high P, people's believability drops right. in the conversion. They don't trust it as much. Absolutely. Yeah. So what about your favorites that you wrote? <laughs> Probably, I mean, the, the the skincare one I think is is a classic that's to the test of time. Um, I, I'll, I'll go with that one as my favorite. You know, doc, doctors are shocked by the sixty second facelift in the bottle that turns back the clock uh, ten years in only sixty days. That was probably my my best tight. You know, every 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 part of that is uh, is punchy. How much time do you spend like in something like that? Um, on the the headline compared to the rest of it, you know, I was I was trained to write, you know, fifty to a hundred headlines, right? Um, which, frankly, I don't I don't do that anymore. Which I, I should I should be banging out that many headlines, you know. These days, I'll write maybe ten, uh, and then try to really craft them. But, you know, now it's more okay. Let's let's take one and just work it to death. Um, instead of having ten and throw or a hundred, but yeah, you know, a sales letter. I used to work on a sales letter for months, uh, you know, because because I just keep editing, editing, editing. Now it depends, you know, where does this is if I'm trying to write a front end winner, I'm gonna work it a lot more. Like right now, I'm working on a letter that uh, hopefully will be a front end winner. So I'm 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 editing it uh, over and over again. I'll do. You know, I have a checklist of edits, you know, power edit list, and I, it's, I think it's over 20 different filters, if you will. So I just go back and back, and, and, and I look for all every single one of these to try to make it as, as compelling, as strong as possible. So what do you mean? What's, what's one thing on the checklist? Um, let me pull up the checklist, yeah. and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read a few of these. Yeah, I'm curious, and also I want to know your process for working a headline to death. Like, do you do you read them to other copywriters, or do you test like just a small amount of traffic to them to see? Yeah, all of the above. Um, you know, I, I do both. So uh, I, I got it open here. But yeah, go ahead. You know, for, first, I'll you know I have a thesaurus in my brain. It's just something that happens as a copywriter. So literally, I, I can read. You know, when I'm editing, I'll see a word, and two, three, four, five words automatically come up. So I'll kind of, the, you know, it's just unconscious now. But I'll literally go through, and I still use thesaurus.com. It's probably one of the most used resources that I tap into as a copywriter. Uh, when I when when my brain can't find the right word, I'll, I'll hit thesaurus and try to find something else. So, you know, to, thesaurus is part of it. Um, you know, just trying to finding interesting combinations of words. It's not just one word; it's two, three words put together. I think "freaky big naturally" is a good example of that. Um, you know, "freaky" with you know, "big naturally" was it just? Yeah, I picture like Incredible Hulk, like when you say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, uh, it was, it was cool. So that was a good, good, interesting uh, combination. And uh, you know, I'm always trying to find those. You know, one of the best places to find those combination of words is on AdWords or Facebook. It's on the paper, it's on the first level because you can test so many words. You know, when you get down to the sales letter, you're not gonna get 
the same conversion, right? I mean, 1% is a good conversion on, on the sales side. So, but with the traffic side on AdWords, I can get, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of clicks a day. Right. So it allows me to test a lot more things. So I call AdWords like a profit laboratory. Yeah. It allows me to, you know, test every possible combination of word uh, and really find what's triggering people to, to to click and go to the next piece. Yes, yeah. So here's some of the edits I do. So first is, is a flow edit, uh, you know, the big chunks, you know, should we move the chunks around so you have a good solid logical flow. Um, you know, fat trimming edit, I, I mean, that's where I'm looking for paragraphs. You know, you know I'm, I'm always looking, can, can we ax this? You know, Cuba, right? Uh, confusing, unbelievable, boring, awkward, that's, that's the filter I'm using. Um, the you edit, so I go back, infuse as much of the word you, your, yours as I can. The niche words, so the niche words is, uh, is something that's interesting. I'll, I'll, especially if I'm in a new market, I'll buy every magazine in the market and I'll go through it and try to find all the niche words, the power words, the combinations that are actually being used. I'll make a list, so I'll have two, three, four, five pages of those. And then when I'm editing, I'm trying to infuse those. So that's that's powerful. The subhead edit, I'll go through every subhead, make them as strong as I can. Smaller paragraphs, smaller sentences, smooth paragraph entry. So I'll look at the beginning of the paragraphs and, and try to make that, you know, can I add a word? Can I make that interesting? Because people scan uh, more than ever. So I want to grab, you know, grab their attention, not just on the subheads, but on the paragraph uh, entry right the read out i mean reading out loud is one of the most important things you have to do if you don't read out loud you're, you're just a lot of stuff you'll never catch especially the awkward component um you know, that's something gary gary Halbert taught me is just read out loud so and i want and i'll get other people to read out loud so i always like to work copying teams uh two or three people and uh i'll always get them to read i'll read so see where people stumble. I mean, somebody stumbles anywhere, you got to rework that automatically. Mm. That, that's my rule. Yeah. Grammar edit, thesaurus edit, idiomy, simile, metaphor, quote edit. I'll, I'll give you another little gem, um, which I call the, the uh, drunk turtle metaphors. Okay. <laughs> so this is something we tested and, and it works. Uh, so we wanted to, you know, as slow as a turtle was, I think, the, the original line of copy. And we're like, you know, what if we kind of make that metaphor funnier? And we came up with sword than a drunk turtle. So the metaphor was enhanced and there's humor that was added to it. And the conversions went up, I think, 20%. And that wasn't even in the headline. It was kind of, you know, a few paragraphs wow. down. That's amazing. So, so, yeah, that was amazing. So so now I'm, I'm very conscious of that and I try to infuse a couple of those in a – in a sales letter, you know, if it can make somebody chuckle or smile, um, I think that that's a win. So yeah, those are the some good ones. The power edit, the inspiration edit, the power word edit, the name dropping edit, the testimonial edit, the photo and graphics edit, the emotional edit, the bold italics highlight underline. Which, by the way, we've tested and mo rarely does that work. So now we we don't we don't even do that. What edit. doesn't work? Uh, bolding and highlighting oh. and all that stuff um, yeah we, we haven't found it to work and uh, yeah so those are just these are some of the edits that I, that I do just some <laughs> that's a lot yeah I mean you can, I can do two or three at once but uh, again that that's what I go through especially if I'm, I'm going for a home run yeah that's and sometimes great. if you're writing a letter I mean here's the here's the other side and I hate to say it but sometimes I'm lazier especially if it's an internal launch and uh, because what I've what we found and we've split tested it is that the copy doesn't matter that much on a launch on an internal launch, and that that means you have a list of people that they've know, they know you, and then you go through the the launch process. Rarely do we find. I mean, we've tested a lot of things on launch day, and rarely does anything move the needle. Yeah. Are there some components people need to make sure they have on the sales pages? That work really well. 
again, strong graphics, you know, great, great pictures of, of you or, and I say great, when I say great, I don't mean, you know, in the, in a, in a, in a studio with the white background looking perfect with makeup and stuff. Uh, you can have a couple of those, but you know, great pictures, I think, uh, are, are probably the biggest thing. Yeah. So Matt, you talked a lot about, you talked about John Carlton, who are some of the other mentors that you have and some of the best advice they've given you? You know, Ted Nicholas was the first guy that I, I got into copywriting with. Um, well, even before that, let me let me rewind. So Frank R. Wallace, who he sold over nine figures of their front end book through direct mail. Wow. So he talked a lot about business and marketing. He was really my first guy. Ted would Ted Nicholas would go speak at some of their events, learn from Ted which was uh, very powerful. And then uh, from Ted and Gary spoke at one of Ted's events, so Gary Halbert, which then led me to Dan Kennedy, uh, then led me to John Carlton, which then led me to Gary Bensavenga, and then Clayton Makepeace. So those, those were, on a copywriting level, um, my main mentors. John Reese, John Reese's event was a big turning point. That was an internet marketing event that he did, that he eventually did traffic secrets with. So his his event was was very powerful as well. Uh, but that was more of the internet marketing side. Mm -hmm. So what's some of the memorable advice uh, they've given you along the way? <clears throat> you know, for anybody that's getting started, um, th this is the shortcut. And it's one of these things that's that's certainly not glamorous, but it works. And, and now I, under I understand the the neurological reasons why it works back then I didn't I just did it and it worked is to copy winners by hand not not speaking them not typing them literally grabbing a pen and writing those by hand and and the reason the by hand factor works compared to let's say typing there's about 10,000 more neurons activated when you're writing by hand and hmm. typing typing is is like 8 or 9 so there's something magical that happens. I remember I was doing that, and next thing you know, I'm I'm speaking in that copywriter's voice, like their voice was in my head, and I could take that voice and start writing my copy with it. So that's the magic of that. You do that, you know, enough. Um, next thing you know, literally, like you're thinking like they did. You're writing like they do. And that's that's where the magic begins. Um, so that was that was driven home. You know, John Reese is the guy that drove home split testing, which I think, as a copywriter, you know, too many copywriters are too confident of their own stuff. You know, they don't realize that at best fifty percent of their ideas are good. The other fifty suck. <laughs> so. Right. They, they, but the, the problem is if you're not testing, you don't know which 50 is what. And um, it doesn't matter if you got a winner. I mean, you know, give me a winner. You know, if you allow me to split test it, I'll make it stronger, guaranteed. So a lot of people, I think, are too cocky or confident with their own copy. And as a result, they're getting maybe a fraction of the results they could be getting. Yeah. So that was driven home to me because, you know, just to really highlight this. If you increase the conversions, let's say 30%, okay, you're, you're increasing the gross revenue by 30%, but let's say before you were buying traffic and you're making 20%, let's say you were making 30% profit on it, okay? So you're, you were spending a buck, making 70 cents back, uh, sorry, you were making a buck 30. So if you increase it 30%, now you're making, you know, a buck 60 something. So you've doubled profits, right? So 30% can mean double the profits. Again, right. it all depends on what your profit margins are yeah. and what your ROI is on the advertising. But man, you know, small, small victories add up very, very quickly, uh, especially when you're, when you're spending money on traffic. Yeah. So man, also you, you do a lot of work with Google AdWords. What, what's a tip you can give people that, works or or is a mistake that they shouldn't do <laughs> you know adwords um has evolved into uh you know not a complicated animal but I, I guess an intimidating animal so 
My first tip is you know, just get in there. I think a lot of people, they get analysis paralysis. It's like, man, this, this big interface with all these tabs and stuff. Right. Um, you know, my tip is get started with like your best keyword or keywords, maybe four or five. I mean the best. You know, if you're selling a DVD on dog training, or let's say it's even more precise, it's German Shepherd dog training. Your your best keyword is German Shepherd dog training DVD, right? I mean, that's that's what you start with. You're not going to start with dog training. Uh, you're going to get slaughtered on that on that word. So I think that's where a lot of people lose money. They they don't go precise enough with their keywords. They they just try to have a big keyword that's going to get a bunch of volume. Mm -hmm. So, you know, be as laser beam as you can. And same thing applies for Facebook. We do a lot of Facebook advertising. And uh, the key to that is laser beam. I mean, if you know that your buyers, 35 to 45 year old women that have money, that, you know, own iPhones, I mean, that, you know, <laughs> like other women, which you can target that. Uh, so that's what you go for. You know, you go for 35 to 45 year old lesbians that own an iPhone that are also into uh, dog training. So that's where marketing has evolved to. There's, there's no limits almost to the, the the specificity of the targeting, especially on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a huge edge for us. I mean, that that's never happened before. What's your process look like, Matt, that um, when you get a project from a client and you're going to start working, where do you start? What do you... What's your process with that? So I want to reframe something and I'm going to go on another tangent go too. Ahead. And that's, I don't have clients, I just do partnerships. Okay. So so I'm a little bit different than than most copywriters that way. I mean, literally, I, I, I don't have clients. I, I just partner up with people in their business. Um, and and that's, that's the ultimate as a copywriter. So for all the copywriters listening, that's probably the most valuable thing if, if you're if if what you're doing right now is is burning and, and turning through clients mm -hmm. uh, I, I highly recommend you change that model and try to find you know one or two great companies with good with again great products that you can partner up with and uh, really build something great and, and make make far more money so just just want to throw I'm that glad in. you made that distinction actually. And did you always do that, or when did you start doing that? Always, always. Doing, always did that. And does, when someone approaches you, do they already know that ahead of time, or do you have to kind of explain how it works? About 50 50. I mean, sometimes people know. Um, that's what they, they, they expect. Another 50% another of the time, people don't know. You got to explain it. Sometimes people don't want to do that, and that's fine. I mean, I'm. I'm just not interested in, in anything right. else either, so right. I just uh, wish wish them the best. Obviously, you probably have different structures with different people. How did you come up with a structure that you know worked for you, but then also that the business owner would be on board with? Um, you know, if if it, it all depends where the business is at. I mean, if it's starting at ground zero, then it's a lot simpler, right? You know, people aren't as protective of something that hasn't no. been. Built I mean, yet. people are pr very protective from the beginning too. That's why I ask, probably. Yeah, you know, again, all all my partnerships have happened relatively organically. So all these people knew of my capabilities before. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, you know, they they felt confident going yeah. in, so to speak. They they weren't. They weren't people that I met at a seminar one day and said, "Hey, tomorrow, hey, can I, can I get half your business?" You knew them, yeah. <laughs> so, so that that wouldn't work. And you know, part of let's talk about something else too, which is okay. There's copywriters, which is again the best foundation. Just like in mixed martial arts, you know, wrestling they say is the best foundation. I think as a marketer, copywriting is the best foundation. The next level from that is really a marketer. So um, the difference between a marketer and a copywriter is the marketer really has the bigger picture in mind, the whole funnel. Um, he looks at, you know, from traffic source down to upsell, what is that going to look like? Right. You need to have an understanding of different traffic sources, 
how, how do they impact sales, what's the best type of traffic sources, um, all these things come into play. Then the next level is really the business owner. So the business owner level, you're thinking about the product, you're thinking about the talent, you're thinking about, and you're also thinking about the funnels, and you're also thinking about the copy. So to become as valuable as you can um, to get these types of partnerships where people are, are excited to partner with you, I think it's important to try to go from copywriter to, to marketer uh, as, as quickly as you can. So that, that's a big distinction. Yeah. I ask that because someone may be watching this and think, Matt, that's what I want to do. I want to start that. How do I even structure it? Because you could arguably say, well, once the product's created, it's created, but then you're going to be doing a lot of the work after it's created. So how do you break up that, that structure? Or maybe I'm talk, thinking about we it. Talk, we talk all day about that, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you some key points. Yeah. So the, the, the simplest deals to make um, or the, the cleanest deals to make are, as, you know, as a marketer or as a copywriter, you find someone that's got, again, that, that secret magic sauce, great product, they're a celebrity, they're one of those things, right, that we talked about earlier. Right. And they're completely under-marketed. I mean, that's the, that's the best scenario. So now, and that's the best scenario for them and for you. It's, that this is the magical win -win. synergy yeah, because yeah. They, they have this amazing resource, whether it's their fame or their skills or their product, whatever it is. And you have this magical resource, which is your skills. And by combining both, you're going to achieve 10x or 20x or even more compared to what they were doing before. So that's the that's what I go for. That's what I seek, and uh, it's pretty simple. I mean, you know, you can again, depending where they're at, um, if if they're just getting started, and and you can really do a fifty fifty partnership. If they already have a lot of success, maybe a little bit less than that. Um, if it's a big company, obviously it's going to be a lot less than that. <laughs> yeah. So. It just depends how big, how developed the company is. But I think for guys getting started, the best scenario is what I said. It's finding that, that person that, again, has a great resource, but they don't know where to go with it or, or how to market it. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I have friends that that's what they did, and they partnered up with the right people, and, and uh, you know, they're, they're, making, they're making probably 50 times what, they, what a copywriter would have made had a copywriter just made a, a straight up deal. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a big difference. Huge difference. Yeah, it's night and day. No, I'm glad you made that distinction with that because, yeah, when I use clients, I use it generally, but yeah, that it's more like a partnership. Yeah, absolutely. So, Matt, tell me, I want to hear, you know, obviously you've done well. I want to hear a painful moment in business, low point, and also um, one of your proudest accomplishments. Low point, so it's actually, it's actually copy related. So I, uh, so this was this was maybe uh, twelve years ago, or so. So I was obsessed with with copy. I was I was you know really working hard, and uh, I hadn't launched anything. You know, I, I suffered from a little bit of perfectionism, which is not a good thing, by the way. So, you know, I just was doubting myself. So I decided to hire who I believed was the best copywriting copywriter in the world at the time. And, you know, I'm not going to name names right. uh, out of respect. If you want to see a picture of him, go on your website and you can see the cartoon picture. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so I hired the best, you know, who I thought was the best. And uh, you know, paid him 15 grand, flew down there. And uh, he ended up changing four words out of my copy, and and by the way, the campaign bombed. It was it was for a personal training thing, so the thing didn't work. And uh, you know, I came back. I, I was just devastated, right? Because that this guy was my hero. So it wasn't just it wasn't just the fifteen grand. It it wasn't just the failure. It was like the falling of a hero. 
which is very painful. I've experienced it maybe twice in my life. It's it's a painful thing. So it's like, man, where do I go to next? And uh, I got on the phone with Dan Gallopu. I don't know if you know who Dan is, Mm-mm. Doberman Dan. Oh, yeah, I've heard of him, yes. Yeah, he's a relatively well-known copywriter. So I talked to Dan, and Dan said, you know what? I mean, what the hell, man? Like, you're good enough. You're good enough. And that's what I needed to hear. So from that moment on, I, I, I launched uh, the skincare offer, I think, two or three months after that. Uh, and, I, of course, I got John's help as well. But, you know, I, I needed to hear that you just launched, just launched the thing. So, you know, now, now we have a couple of expressions. Get the baby out. Put the ship in the water. Uh, go. I mean, you know, so – now I'm more I'm far more on the other side of just just ship ship the, the freaking thing instead of uh, right. trying to perfect it to death. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, that's got to be tough. What about your proudest moment? One of your proudest moments as a copywriter? I, I think I think I've never attained the high that I did from that first winter. I mean, you know, because because it was it was validation. I mean, um, when you validate that you you've got a dream and now you know that you can do it that's that was the sweetest moment because after that i mean I, i've had much bigger winners since but they still didn't have that that you know euphoria of being going from man can i do this i don't know to oh man this this is a cash machine i've, I've done it and i can do it again so that that was probably the biggest highlight so what was your reaction when you found out the results, <laughs> man, you know, I mean, well, it was it was very quick. I think we put up the campaign on AdWords, and I think we got our first sale in, in an hour or something. So, I mean, it's just it's just uh, ecstasy. You're just like, man, I, I can't believe this is happening. It's kind of disbelief and ecstasy and all that, all that combined. Yeah. So, man, I have one last question for you. But before I ask it, tell people where can they find out more about you? What are you working on lately? Yeah, so um, the thing I'm the most excited about and, and been working uh, my ass off for the last couple of years is a the ultimate tracking system for online marketers, which you can find at infiniteprofitsolutions.com. Mm-hmm. The system is called Gold Lantern, and it, it allows you to track with 99% accuracy the, the visitor value, no matter how many sites you have, no matter where they buy, even if they're deleting their cookies, we can still achieve 99% tracking accuracy. Hmm. And uh, there's a lot of killer power tools. So as far as you know, it, really every internet marketer that's, that's spending money on advertising should use this. and It's very, very powerful. So if anybody's interested in uh, getting an account, just go to Infinite Profit Solutions and you can sign up for a beta user account and uh, we should be full blown launch very very shortly so infinite profit solutions.com correct got it yeah so matt my last question you know since this is inspired insider you know my question for you is what was a moment when you had to overcome a huge challenge and then what you thought about and inspired and motivated you to push forward and I know you have a really deep, painful story from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's yeah let's go to that one. Um, yeah, you know, I was I was married, and uh, again, I had the big dream of of you know having this type of business. You know, I wanted to. You know, my my bigger goal was actually to to live abroad, to live in the world. Uh, which I do now. I live in Panama, but I knew to be able to do that, I needed to build this kind of business. So that's that's why I was so attracted to internet marketing. And you know, I was already in debt quite a bit from student loans. I was, you know, forty k in the hole there, and then uh, you know, other other debts kept <laughs> kept coming in. So I was I was very deep in the hole at that point. And despite all that. Um, I was making money as a trainer, so I took all the money I made and I just started going to seminars. And you know, I went to John Carlton's, Dan Kennedy's last copywriting seminar. I went to Gary Halbert's, a few of those. I went to uh, Gary Bensavengas. I went to Clayton Make Pieces, and, and so on and so forth. Plenty of other internet marketing stuff. So invested 
I mean, pretty much all the money I was making at that time in, in learning. And, you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of uh, fear. You know, there was a lot of fear and all that. And, of course, you know, the, the uh, copywriting experience happened. So that, that compounded the, the experience. Then I got robbed. I had, I had some cash saved at home. Somebody broke in while I was in New York, stole my safe um, with, with uh, you know, five figures in cash. Wow. So that, that, that hurt. Um, and then I got scammed by another guy on top of that for about another 7K. So it, it was just a brutal, you know, a brutal year. Like the it was perfect like three, storm. It all happened at once. It was a perfect once. storm of just horrible financial uh, circumstances. And then uh, the dead. The, then the copywriter was really the darkest moment. You know that that experience. So the turning point was just saying, you know what, I, I can do it. I'm gonna do it, and launching and and in the face of all that, and then everything turned around and, and the rest is history. So yeah, I mean, what were you, you know, thinking about that motivated you to do that? Because when you're at that time and all that happens at once. You know, you could say that now, and it's easier to say, but at the time, it's probably not so easy. Yeah, again, uh, I think one of the big things is, is you need to work with, you know, we need validation sometimes. Um, I didn't realize how good I, I had become. You know, I had been working on my chops for two, three years and really, you know, writing letters and, I mean, you know, mm. working on it. So I had gotten to a certain level that was that was good enough to write a control, but I didn't know it, right? I did not know it. So when Dan Gallup who said, you're good enough, that's what I needed to hear. Hmm. So I think for all the copywriters, you know, you need to work with, you know, a mentor, uh, you know, find somebody that's willing to, to coach you, hire them, pay them, join a, a, a copywriting some sort of, of thing where you can get feedback on your copy because you know a few months ago I, I looked for a, a mentee you know and, and I looked at a lot of copy and you know there was a big <laughs> a lot of guys copy weren't that good and some some were better than they thought so um, I think people need feedback and people need to be told that this sucks start over or this is good and, and when a good copywriter that's got experience tells you this is good you know, be proud of that moment. That's that's your turning point. You know, that's that's when you uh, you just go for it. Yeah. So was that advice or that those words from Dan that kind of pushed you over? Yeah. I don't think he knows that. I should I should send him a box of cigars. We'll, or something. we'll send him a clip of this. <laughs> yeah. He's a good guy. He's another good guy. I'd recommend yeah. talking to uh, Dan. Dan has a lot of uh, copywriting experience. Yeah. No, Matt, I appreciate your time. This has been hugely valuable. And who else would you, anyone else that you'd recommend that you know that you trust that should be included in the Legends of Copywriting series? Legends of Copywriting series? Well, if you, if you really want an interview with Elliot, I can, I can probably make that happen. But he's not really a copywriter, so I don't know if, yeah. uh, if you want to talk to him about that. You know, copywriting-wise... I mean, I think some of the best guys out there right now, uh, John Benson, Chris Haddad, Frank Kern, th those three come to mind as far as some of the yeah. most skilled guys yeah. at the, at right sure. now. Yeah, for sure. Matt, it's an absolute pleasure. Hopefully we'll meet someday when you come back to the States in the cold weather. And yeah. uh, thanks so much. Yeah, by the way, there's direct flights, Panama, Chicago. So uh, All right. maybe, maybe I'll end up in Chicago one of these days. Anytime. Pizza's on cool. me. All right. All right. Perfect. All right. Thanks, thanks Matt. Bye-bye.